Hello and welcome to Creativity Conversations, episode 12. And this afternoon or this morning, depending on when, where you are, I have the pleasure of speaking with David Beeler. Hello, David. Hey, good morning. Good Lovely morning. Hi. To have you here? Thank you, Nina. Thanks for having me. This yeah. is a, a fun opportunity to talk about creativity, something that uh, I identify with strongly. You sure do. You embody it. <laughs> I'm going to read your bio. Oh. Just to remind you of your own background. Born and raised in Kerrville, Texas, or is that Carville? Kerrville. Kerrville. David's creativity was fostered by his mother, the Queen of Quack. <laughs> the Queen of Quacks. <laughs> no, she was not an illegitimate doctor. She was the Queen of Crafts. <laughs> she was constantly doing craft projects. There was always uh, several projects laid out at the same time with her doing something. Well, now I'm not sure I don't even try to finish the rest of this bio, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so his mother would take something that would, was going to be discarded and regularly ask David and his brother, what else could you do with that? David has explored his creativity along various avenues. He was classically trained as an actor in England, has pursued his acting as his main vocation, having appeared in various TV shows and movies and over 100 commercials. David has funded his UK training by writing and producing plays. And he has also been a professional photographer for over 20 years. In addition to that, he's also ventured into writing fiction, producing movies, directing mu music videos, building furniture, painting sculpture, bathroom and kitchen design and remodeling, architecture, lyric writing, and has some inventions that he'd like to develop. But wait, there's more. At the beginning of the pandemic, feeling concerned that his bill paying artistic pursuits would grind to a lockdown halt, he pivoted and created an organic produce delivery company, which has been serving families in LA by bringing fresh produce to people's doors. His most recent music video feature, featuring Arlo Guthrie and Jim Wilson launched just over a week ago on rollingstone.com. But the creations he's most proud of are a joint venture with his wife, his two boys, Kai and Ryder. David, is there something you haven't explored yet? Oh, you haven't tons. <laughs> There's tons. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. You know, I, I hear some people go, uh, at one point, um, Mike Neal and I were doing this seminar and we had this life expectancy exercise. So it would roll out like three or 400 years. And like if you lived for three or 400 years, you know, well, how would things change? What values would shift? What goals would shift? And some people go, I wouldn't want to live that long. And I thought, God, why not? You, you could do everything then. <laughs> it's like, you get it all done. And then you wouldn't, still wouldn't run out, you know? So uh, I'm sure there's a, a ton of things I haven't tried, but, but I've tried a lot. <laughs> and you're certainly willing. That yes. I think has struck me as one of the really uh, amazing things about you. And, and when we had first had a, a fairly lengthy conversation was uh, one of the super coach uh, uh, intensives when we actually had them in person. And we had that conversation about multi-potentialites. Yeah. You remember that? Oh, completely. We were, we were waiting to get some lunch and uh, that was about the time that uh, I have a short story that just got published in an anthology. And, and I think I was telling you about that. And I think I read it. Well, I asked you if you would, you know, to give me some feedback on it before it actually got published. And um, so, yeah, you said, you said, oh, you're a multi-potentialite. And I had never heard the word. And I said, okay, I have some idea of what that is, just by the way it sounds. But uh, I was like, what exactly is that? And you described it. And I was like, oh, my God, that's me. Yeah. So. Uh, in, in the old days, you know, we, uh, it would have been a Renaissance man, a Renaissance person, um, which is nice, or Renaissance, as they would say in England. Um, and, and I think some of, the, some of why that seems unusual is that our, our cultural values have shifted. If you look, you know, at the Age of Enlightenment, that was the, that was the, the aspiration, was to be well-versed in a, a number of areas and to explore science and geography and the arts and to paint and play musical instruments to, to be very well versed was 
was the uh, the epitome and, and, and you know, the aspiration. Um, but as we moved into the 20th century, it, it became, or, or the West became a culture of specialists. So you pick one thing, I'm gonna be a lawyer, and that's all you do. And then if you're a lawyer, you're gonna do uh, corporate law. And if you do corporate law, you're gonna do corporate law contract or uh, intellectual property, or you know, it gets very, 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 very niche. Yeah. So um, the fact that I seem unusual or multi-potentialites is a category of people seem unusual. It's just because culturally we've aimed in a different direction, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the idea of being a, a specialist now is, so over revered yeah. and you can see the problem with it with the number of people who go into a profession practice it for a year or two and say oh my i've made a big mistake I've made a huge investment and i don't like this at all and yeah. then they're they're beating themselves up because they haven't done the, the thing that makes their heart sing and yeah. then it things stall for them before they begin to pick up and find a rhythm for for themselves. And for people on the call who have not heard that term before, multi-potentialite, it means uh, people who display um, an attitude or an interest or an aptitude across a lot of different disciplines. So they're good at a lot of different things. And uh, I've heard it said, and I think I can read this one, uh, that they have three superpowers. One is idea synthesis, one is rapid learning, and the third one is adaptability. Yeah. Yeah. So all of that combined, <clears throat> I mean, it makes sense that you, it would be an asset and not a, a liability or to be seen as something, somebody being flaky. Yeah. Uh, you know, even for me, I've had times where I've, I've wondered because professionally I've done this and then this and I've started different businesses and kind of thought, God, if I just would settle on one thing and just do that, maybe, maybe things would go better for me. But uh, it was only a few, a few a decade ago that I kind of went, that's just not going to happen. That's not how I'm wired. Yeah. I'm never going to just do one thing because uh, I'm interested in too many things. Um, <clears throat> and some of that might be uh, genetic because my dad's side uh, was like engineers. So the, the sort of science thing and having an aptitude for that type of um, that type of thinking was there. And then on my mom's side, there were artists, painters and jazz musicians. And, you know, my grandmother was an occupational therapist. So she took art and applied it to therapy. So that uh, combination, I think, allowed me to do that. But I think it's also just innate in all of us, you know, that we are made of creativity. We are yeah. the life force flowing through us is creativity. And so <clears throat> my wife, a while back at one point, I don't know what was going on, but she said, oh, I'm just not creative. And I started laughing because I really got that, oh my God, you're so creative and you just don't see it. You, you know, if you understand the, the ideas of the three principles, you know, we live in our thought created world and we're constantly creating that world all the time, perpetually. So every moment that we live is an act of creativity, <laughs> whether we recognize it, acknowledge it or not. You know, and what I've done is just had an aptitude for going down a more traditional path of what people think is being creative, which is, you know, uh, art, and photography and writing, and yeah. acting, stuff like that. Well, that was my, my um, as I think I said to you, that was my impetus for even creating these conversations because so many people equate creativity with being an artist. You know, mm. I, have to, I have to be able to... <clears throat> or sing or write in a yeah. way that is universally understood and appreciated. Yeah. And the, the everyday things that take a little bit of curiosity and wondering uh, don't seem to fall into that category for people, which. Yeah, it's an unfortunate definition and, and sort of one which is like, oh, there's that and that's creative and anything else is not. And, and that's just unfortunate because anytime you problem solve, anytime you're wondering, Anytime you're curious, you're evoking creativity in the pursuit of that. And I think, you know, you just look at kids, uh, you know, uh, I, I had the opportunity to, to film the writer seminar with Michael Neal and Steve Chandler. And Steve Chandler was talking about, uh, you know, children. He said, 
big difference between children and adults is you ask a child to sing a song and they'll just sing a song, you know, or dance, you know, and, and you ask an adult, and they're, oh, well, no, I, I, don't, I don't really dance, unless there's alcohol involved. So, uh, you know, um, so somewhere along the way, we had that, create, that creative, um, uh, the creative mojo <laughs> uh, as kids, where it was just, we were doing it all the time and we were exploring and wondering and, and you know, look, look what I made, mommy, it's a drawing, it's you, it's the dog, you know, we, we just did it. Yeah. And then somewhere uh, as we got more into our personalities, we went, oh, this is what is creative, what is not, this is who I am and who I'm not. And it begins to get limited and a little bit ossified. Yeah. Yeah. But it's all there. It's still there because we're alive. Until you're dead, it's there. <laughs> and even then, who knows? I, I can't speak to that. <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm just going to share this little um, story about um, a child who was at our, uh, in our swimming pool the other day. She's five. And speaking to the idea that creativity is in us and it is us, we, um, she was just getting comfortable being in the water. She didn't really know how to swim and she was just learning how to go underwater and hold her nose. And she hadn't yet learned how to not hold her nose and still go underwater. And so she's in the pool, she's playing, she doesn't have her floaties on. And at one point she just, she just let her hand go and she went underwater. And she was so excited that she could do it. And then she, within 10 minutes, she started kicking her, going underwater, kicking her feet and paddling her hands. She'd never yeah. done it before. Like yeah. I was there in that moment. And there was so much joy. She was leaping out of the pool. Look what I can do. I can swim. Yeah. Yeah. And that sense of joy and look what I can do is so strong in kids. But for adults, they don't want to go through the learning process. They just want the end result rather than the joy of discovery that's in the process. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that, that uh, unfolding is both part of the pleasure and part of um, how you get there. You know, you can't, yeah. you, know, you can't get to the result without the journey. You know, I can't get from where I'm in LA to where you are in New York without journeying somehow. Yeah. He's not yet, you know, somebody invents the <laughs> transporter. And even then, you would just journey very quickly. <laughs> so there's still a exactly. journey. By locating. A, a quantum journey. Yeah. That's it. So I would love to uh, yeah. ask you about a couple different things. And then at the half hour, we'll open it up to questions or comments from people who are in the peanut gallery. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was your pivoting, your so-called pivoting to create yeah. something new during the pandemic and how that even came to mind for you. Okay. I was um, working, filming uh, Super Coach Academy for Michael Neal <clears throat> and the pandemic lockdown was looming. And so I began to go, Ooh, what am I going to do if this happens? Because it appeared to me that, you know, no one would be producing TV shows or commercials. No one would be hiring a photographer. You know, all the things I did was like, uh, that's about to stop. You know, and those are the ways that, uh, you know, I pay the bills. So I thought, oh dear, well, what am I gonna do? And I started getting nervous and, and uh, frankly, a little scared, uh, like so many people. And then <clears throat> I had an opportunity to talk with Mavis, who's amazing. And uh, she said, why are you trying to scare yourself with your thinking like that? And I heard it enough to go, oh, okay. If I can look at this without fear, I'll figure it out. I'll find a way. So I just, the next thing that came to mind was, well, okay, what do people need right now? And I had two thoughts. I thought, well, they, they need to be less fearful, <laughs> like I was. Uh, and then I thought, well, there's all these people that Michael's training and people I know that, you know, coaches like yourself who help people with that. And I thought, okay, that's pretty covered. But then the next thought was people need to eat. And I thought, oh, okay. So the first idea was to do uh, some kind of provision delivery to just bring food to people so they wouldn't have to go out and risk getting it. Uh, and I have a neighbor who is a, 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 has a bar restaurant. And so I talked with him about doing this and his, his partner said, no, we don't want to do that. So I just thought, well, I'm going to do it. 
And I thought, well, at that time, people, the lockdown had actually happened. And people were, um, seemed to be stocked up on pasta and canned goods and toilet paper. So, so I thought, well, people need fresh food. You know, they need to eat something fresh. And in a week or two, they're going to be jonesing for something that's not in a can. So I thought, all right, we'll do organic, well, we'll, do, we'll do produce. And then people I talked to about it, it mattered that it was organic. So we went, all right, it's going to be organic produce. And uh, first week I lost money. I had to subsidize that because uh, the, 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 I picked a farm up the coast and they didn't quite get what I was doing. They were trying to sell me at farmer's market retail prices and it just didn't work. <clears throat> I thought, well, this isn't tenable. So uh, pivoted again in terms of supply and found uh, some organic suppliers that uh, were willing to work with me on wholesale rates. And so we were in the black in our second week and we've been doing that every week since, uh, since the lockdown. So there's a, a bunch of families and it's really nice in a way. Some of them are, um, you know, immune compromised. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's been nice that those people have, have remained safe. That's just been a really nice uh, sidebar to it. Um, it's changed our eating habits uh, in my family. So that's been really good. Um, you know, I think we're eating much healthier than we were prior to the lockdown and, and much more consciously. So that's mm. really good. Um, yeah, and it's, it, it was just a response to things changing. And, and one of the things that I think was really good was I've spent a number of years going uh, sort of navel gazing about what should I be doing? I could do this and I could do this. And I could be an actor. And you know, what should I be doing? Because there's, I don't say this with uh, arrogance, but I, I kind of believe that there's anything I could, I could do almost anything. I'm sure there's some things I can't. Like, I don't think if you ask me to figure out, you know, quantum calculus, I probably would be like, yeah, I'll get back to you. But pretty much anything, I, you know, I, I had that sense that I could do anything. So I could turn my hand to anything. Um, but with this, I went, what do people need? So my focus went out in terms of instead of in. And that was very helpful in terms of just setting up a business that I knew nothing about within a week and having it be, you know, having it work within the second week. Well, I, I love that your orientation came from that question, what do people need? Yeah. Because even though the question had been swirling around in your mind over a period of time, what should I do, what should I do? It, was, it became really clear to you when you asked that question. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. about how can I showcase my talents, it's what do people need? Yeah, and, and, and that flowed out of that thing of looking at a scary situation and just going, Oh, I'm creating the fear. Mm -hmm. So if I come at this without fear, what can I see? Yeah. You know, and, and, and that was really um, powerful yeah. you know, to, to, to be able to just see that and just to get that deeply. Yeah. And then to be able to act on it and see it come, into fruition the way you did. Yeah. You know, and there was a lot involved and, you know, and, and I'm still working that. I mean, there's still some, you know, there's things to be attended to. Um, but it's, it's really been very, it's been a blessing for us, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just to keep us sustaining through these times, changing rating habits, you know, and, and so it's been, and, you know, this is the year of things I didn't see coming because I, certainly didn't see that I would be hoiking vegetables <laughs> back in February. That did not, was not on my radar uh, at all. <laughs> um, and then there was it's been a handful of, of other interesting things that I just didn't see coming. You know, some of them like the pandemic, which were not, you know, great, but some of them have been really cool. Well, speaking about um, the range of your experiences, uh, let's shift gears and talk about the music video that you recently produced. Cause that was well, something you weren't, it, it yeah. hadn't seen co coming either, right? No, that was a total surprise. Um, so Jim Wilson, who is uh, a very beautiful accomplished pianist and um, he's become a friend of mine over the years. I photographed his CD covers back in the day and then have done over the last several years a, a bunch of music videos with him. So he reached out and said, Hey, 
Uh, he said, really interesting thing just happened. He said, um, years ago, I gave, uh, he was at a Grammy event, and he gave Arlo Guthrie one of his CDs, and he and Arthur began corresponding over the years, and just were fans of each other. And so um, he said, Arlo just reached out to me, and he wants to do a cover of this song, the Stephen Foster song called uh, Hard Times Come Again No More. And he said, and, and I think we're going to do it. He said, now I have some ideas about how it could happen. And he said, I got a, my arranger, uh, who's this guy that works with Phil Collins. And he said, he's uh, Brad, Brad Cole. And he said, we're working on the song. And he said, I think it's going to be really important to have a, a video aspect to push it out through social media, given that we're all on lockdown. So I want to bring you in early. So I said, oh, cool. All right. So we started putting uh, together a, an idea of the 1918 pandemic and then now, and we were gonna go back and forth between images of then and now, with the idea that uh, basically it would be about, this too shall pass, we'll get through these times, hard times come again no more. And then, um, then uh, George Floyd and all the, the, the overdue fallout uh, uh, Black Lives Matter happened at that time. And it was like, wow, well, we can't not touch on that because we would be tone deaf to, and Jim said, he said, we'd be tone deaf to not have this. And so then we tried to figure out what direction this wanted to go now. And, and it was sort of serving two masters in a way. It was trying to go this way and that way. And it was, I kept saying to Jim, I don't, I don't have a handle on what this wants to be now. But we kind of meandered through it and, and, and then uh, at the very early part of this, uh, when, Jim, when Jim sent me the first uh, rendition of it, I listened to it and I was you know, reading the lyrics and it, it was written in, I think, 1848, right? So it's been around. But the last verse was, it's a dirge sung around the grave. and It's really a downer. It's like, wow. I said, given where we are now, I think it needs to be, we, we should add a verse that would be more uplifting. And I just wrote down a verse, you know, what came to me and it took maybe 10 minutes, 15. And I sent that to Jim. I said, I have no stake in this. I just think it would help the song if we added uh, uh, sort of an epilogue verse. That would be more uplifting. <clears throat> and Jim was a like, great idea. And he made a couple of tweaks and he sent it to Arlo Guthrie and Arlo made some tweaks and it became part of the song. And so uh, Jim being uh, such a wonderfully generous guy. He was like, hey, you're going to have a writing credit with me and Arlo on this song. <laughs> so I had to join ASCAP. <laughs> and I'm, now I have a music publishing company. <laughs> and I didn't see that coming. I didn't see having a, 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 a writing credit with Arlo Guthrie coming. And, and the music video, then once we got it done, we found out a way to transition from this black and white into the color, which made it like, here's the transition from then to now. It just came together really beautifully. And some other people contributed uh, gorgeous stuff to the song. Uh, Vanessa Bryan wrote a uh, choral arrangement and brought in singers mm -hmm. and, and, and it just lifted the song. And, you know, and Arlo's Arlo and great in it. It's just, <clears throat> I just thought it turned out really beautifully. And, and we were concerned about the video in terms of, did we hit the tonal aspects of the social justice right was were people going to be upset oh you should have gone further you should have been or are they going to go hey you know it's too much and so we were really kind of not sure how it was going to be received and it's been really well received yeah. um then arlo's people loved it and they brought in a publicist and we she hooked us up through uh rolling stone and it premiered on their platform uh, about a week and a half ago um so you know, I think we're approaching 50,000 views, you know, which is just neat. And the oh, fact that a, <clears throat> a music video I did premiered on uh, rollingstone.com is kind of, kind of nifty. I didn't see that coming. Kind of nifty. Um, and then they really, really like the song. So uh, there is um, some campaigning to be done uh, to go for a Grammy nomination. Oh my God. So, so we'll see what happens, but uh that's really cool. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. You know, uh, it was just like Jim, who I've worked with said, Hey, you want to do this video? And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do something. That'd be cool. So <laughs> there you go. I, you know, you, you can't predict 
the meandering path that yeah. things will take. But that is the unfolding of life. If you look at almost every kind of cool thing in your life, most of it's not very linear. Yeah. Or not in my not in my experience. Well, I think that speaks to a couple qualities that, again, I think you really embodied uh, so beautifully. And one is being open because mm. there are people who have their blinders on. Lots of us do yeah. for whatever uh, reasons. And we can't, we might not see that thing that's on the periphery or we might yeah. not look at that shiny thing and realize there's a possibility there. Oh yeah, even this weekend uh, on Sunday, we, we went out to <clears throat> do some photography with my goddaughter, Maisie. She's 18, amazing dancer. She's going off to college, hopefully, <laughs> in the autumn, uh, in September. You know, hopefully, uh, she'll actually be going to school instead of online. But um, she's going to be a dance major, and she's really amazing. So we were going to do this photo shoot. And uh, I originally planned to go down to Laguna Beach, where these tide pools would be really neat to shoot. And, and there were some things I wanted to do uh, that we agreed would be really cool. But then we thought, oh, it's, it's the last weekend before school starts. It's going to be crazy crowded, and that's going to not help. So then we decided we'll go to El Matador Beach, which I photographed at before, and it's a beautiful spot. But when we got there, there was like no place. That it was Traffic was backed out into the street, and we were waiting like seven deep just to turn left, and then people were turning right, so we were going to wait. And I thought, oh, this I just had that feeling. Life is telling me something. This is not right. I just had that feeling of like, okay, this isn't going to work. We got to go somewhere else. And I went, oh, there's another beach up the road. So I pulled out my phone, looked it up. It's seven minutes away. I said to Nina, okay, seven minutes along is Leo Carrillo Beach. I said, and uh, Nick, Maisie's boyfriend was with us. I said, have you ever been to that beach? They go, yeah, we've been there. I'm like, okay, is there things that look, you know, are there rock formations that we could use to shoot? He said, yeah, there's some at one end. And I'm like, that's where we're going. And then we drove down there and it was fantastic. And, and we got some really beautiful and amazing shots. Oh, they're amazing. But, <clears throat> but that sort of, you know, plan one fell away, plan two, you know, we just had to make a, a decision in the moment, which was like, no, this isn't gonna work. We're gonna have to wait too long to compromise the fact we would, you know, could have been sitting there for an hour trying to get into a, <clears throat> the parking lot to park. Yeah. To find that, well, by the time we got down to the beach, you know, it, it, we're, we're losing light. We're losing light. Yeah. So that's what, what you're talking about to me speaks <clears throat> of another quality, which is being willing to be flexible and shift gears rather than, you know, digging your heels in and saying, no, we've got to do this and we've got to do this here because I don't know and, and walling yourself off to something else. And that seems to me a characteristic of, uh, multi-potentialites, we can already call them that, um, who are willing to be very lightly engaged, which does not mean full, uh, not fully engaged. It means being able to dance around whatever obstacles or challenges appear to be there. I think people understand that best when they think of sports. Mm -hmm. If you play soccer or any sport, you are fully in that game if you're competing, right? or even just having a friendly match, you are completely committed to kicking that ball into that goal and winning, right? But you don't take it seriously. Yeah. There's a lightness to it while being fully, full out committed. So that's the, the I think that's the approach for creative endeavors, um, no matter what they are, if you're starting a new business or making a cake or something, you know, whatever that is, but it's like, I'm gonna do this but in the doing of it, being able to shift gears and be malleable and not get upset if it's not working as you think it's supposed to. Yeah. And I've gotten much better about that over the years of, of sort of surrendering to life and, and frequently kind of going, if I'm going down a path and I am hitting resistance, like there's a part of me which wakes up and goes, wow, okay, maybe life with a capital L is telling me this isn't the way. And that's what happened uh, when we were sitting on the highway in Malibu, you know, trying to get to El Matador Beach. I was like, okay, this is, the energy's wrong. It is feeling like, eh, eh, eh. and it's like, okay, maybe life wants me to do something else. You know, I was still chasing getting the photo shoot done, but, but like going, oh, okay, maybe there's something else I need to learn here. And that's allowed me to surrender more readily, more easily, and more quickly 
than I did when I was younger and much more willful about what I thought was supposed to happen and how, <clears throat> how it was supposed to happen. Yeah. You know, one of the, one uh, example for me, which happened, I think it was last year when I was in Michael's uh, Emerging Voices program was we went on his Hay House radio show and there were seven of us there plus Michael plus Lynn Robertson and we got to the studio and they didn't know or somehow got mixed up that there were going to be so many of us in there and they didn't have the space for it. They didn't have a studio that was right for it. And so without raising an eyebrow, either of them, Michael and Lynn said, okay. And they scouted around in the building for a space that we could work in and finally settled on this. As the clock was ticking, we had maybe five minutes or something before he was supposed to go on air. They found another studio that was really only sized enough for two people to come in. And so Lynn was our, our um, traffic light and uh, we would go in, would be with Michael and talk with Michael and then she'd direct us out. The next person would come in and the sound engineer was totally floored. He could not believe that there was no argument, there was no resistance, there was no pushback on their mistake. And they handled it with such ease that any other situation would have been a nightmare, a total disaster. Yeah. But that flexibility and that openness, okay, what can we do with this? What else is possible? That yeah. became the MO for what happened. And it was all fun. We had a great time doing it. Well, that goes back to that, that thing my mom used to do where she would, you know, uh, you know, for example, this looks like a lens, but it's actually a mug. So if I was going to get rid of this for some reason, because we lost the lid, my mom would go, Hey, before we throw this out, what else can you make out of this? What else can you do with this? And she'd constantly do this with all kinds of things or craft stuff she had laying around, you know, like, Hey, here's a block of wood. What can you do with this? And I was required, you know, I wouldn't be punished or anything, but I was required to come up with three things. And, and it sort of helped train me in that, that idea of, of, you know, uh, looking at things from different angles, coming at it outside the box and also, um, synthesizing being able to go, oh, whether the problem was like, okay, there's no room for seven people in this space, what else can we do? Okay, what else can we do? How can we make this work? What's a, what's a solution? And I'm really good at repurposing things. It's like taking, this could be this, you know, and, yeah. and, and transforming it somehow. Uh, and that's true of, of physical things, but also ideas and, and situations, you know, yeah. like, you know, uh, if you're producing like, when I produced a movie, there's constantly situations like that where you arrive and something's not there that you thought was going to be there and you have to figure out a way to make it work. You know, so. A superpower. That, uh, the superpower uh, of, of flexibility and, and yeah. synthesis and responsiveness. And, and, you know, for me, the word this year is pivoting, you know, because I feel like I'm constantly pivoting. Um, but at the same time, picking up really neat things that are in, in my traditional wheelhouse, like yes. the, the video for Jim that's now, you know, just amazing, yeah. <laughs> crazy. Um, you know, uh, even that, uh, the photo session for Maisie turned out, you know, really beautifully. I, I really thrilled with some of the, the shots and, oh yeah, you know. Uh, I've heard a lot of feedback cool. about those photographs. They're, everyone is saying the same things. Just beautiful, yeah. inspiring photographs. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. Cold, but fun. We are at a, a little <clears> past <throat> the half hour, and I'd love to open this up to questions or comments from anybody who was on the call with us. So raise your hand, and we'll go with you. Otherwise, we'll just keep yakking. Jackie. Oh. <clears throat> Hi, Jackie. Jackie. Hi. Hi. Good, Good to see you. It's great to see you. I did. I didn't. Um, I didn't raise my hand though. I'm just listening. Oh. I oh. Thought, all right. Was glad that, to have you on the call. Was that poem uh, drowning, not waving? <laughs> By Stevie. Uh, I didn't matter. Uh, all right. Well, nice to have you on the call, Jackie. Let's go to Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi. Hi to both of you. Um, 
David, I love hearing your stories. It's nice to, to, to hear about each of the different projects and, and how you see them and, and what you've done. But there's a question that came to mind as you were, as you were um, talking about the video yeah. that I felt was different. Um, so what is different or what do you see when it comes to working with other people? So that looked like some, a project that was more collaborative and where there's more, there's different voices of creativity um, versus a, you know, the, the photo shoot or um, looking to how to, uh, what people need. Um, how does that one differ or how does, what does that look like to you when it comes with collaborating with others? Um, it depends. Um, certainly Jim and I have worked together and we kind of collaborate really well. We, we play well in the sandbox and, and I get that at the end of the day, it's his project. So, you know, any creative choices ultimately are his, but I'm at perfect liberty because he really respects my input to go, wait a minute, what about this? And, and for example, there was a point where I really felt strongly that this was the point in the music when the, the, the chord modulated and, and it became more hopeful that that's the moment where we go to color and, and, and I was very clear that we needed to only lightly touch on some of the social justice things so that we weren't ignoring it, but that what the song wanted to be about was humans triumphing over adversity as we've done through time, you know, that these hard times will pass, this too shall pass. So it wasn't specifically about the pandemic, it wasn't specifically about, you know, social justice and, 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 and dealing with those things, which, you know, we need to, but, but that's not what this song would be about. It was about, as humans, we will get through this, all of it. Um, and, and, and he was sort of like, okay, okay, I hear you. Especially because I was kind of like, no, this, I'm telling you. And I was like really quite uh, clear about it. Not, not even argumentative, but just like clear, like this is, this is where it wants to change. And he was like, okay, okay. And he heard that. And then, you know, so we have a really good uh, collaborative relationship. Um, I'm working with a client right now, uh, doing some Photoshop and, and uh, web design for them. And it's a new client. And, and a couple of things came back where I, I put some ideas in. He said, no, no, we don't want to do that. We've already kind of gone through this. I was sort of like, okay, full, I get it. You know, this is your thing and you already have a clear vision of what you want. My job is to just uh, service that vision. But every now and again, because I can't help myself, if I have an idea, I put it in, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not attached to my ideas because I know I've, my ideas, they come all the time. So if I have a cool idea and somebody rejects it, that doesn't matter. I'll have another cool idea in a minute. So I have no, no ego stake in, in my ideas being the ones that get used because I just know that they keep coming. You know, I have ideas all the time. I, but, uh, Nina, at some point, we need to do something on how to, how to uh, bring all the ideas one has into fruition. <laughs> that's, that's a course that I want to sign up for. <laughs> okay. How many lifetimes are we going to include with that? Oh, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to be around for a while then. Yeah, it's going to be a very long program. <laughs> right. We'll take some breaks in between. That's right, lots of breaks. <laughs> Thanks, so, Christy. Christy, I hope that answered your question. Did that, did that help? Um, yeah. To me, what I, what I do is... And it's, it's like this, if somebody says, hey, I wrote, I wrote a poem and I'd love your feedback on it, then I'll read it and I'll give them, I float feedback. So I'll say the first thing I think, like, hey, I'll just pick something that, you know, I was like, this seems like you set up a rhyming stanchion and then you didn't follow it. And that felt weird. Why'd you do that? And I'll ask them. And then if they resist that feedback, well, if they got defensive and, and like, well, then I go, okay, you can't hear me. So there's no point in me continuing to give you my honest feedback. But if they hear me and they go, oh, well, this is why I was doing it, because I wanted to set up a rhythm and then break it. And I go, oh, great. Okay, now I get it. You know, or if they go, oh, I see what you're saying. Then I go, okay, we can have a conversation that's a two-way conversation, not a one-way street. And if I'm hired or doing something for somebody that is a one-way street, then I get it. Okay, this is a one-way street. My job is to just put my stuff in and do that to the best of my ability, but not, not get overly uh, invested because they want to do their thing and not, they don't want to collaborate. 
So that's the first thing is I, I test the waters for how open they are to collaborating. And if they're open, then, then yeah, I'll throw, throw everything in. And it's always just fun if you play with somebody who wants to play with you, not tell you what, not boss you. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with somebody else having a very clear vision and, and you just servicing that vision. That's absolutely fine. You know, but, uh, so I hope that helps. And, and then it's also just respect and, and, and fun. You know, it's like, like I say, I, I respect other people's creativity, but I also know that my, my pipe is flowing, so I don't have to get hung up on any particular thing. Nice. Hope that answered that a little bit. No, no, she's just waving. <laughs> waving, not drowning. We're going to go over to Gary. Thanks, Crispy. Oh, well, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jackie, if you really are. In yes. Okay, we'll get you next. Thank you. Hey, Gary. Hey, David, how are you? <laughs> Great, man. I'm enjoying this chat. Oh, I'm really enjoying it, too. And I'm, I'm loving what you're saying about creativity. And it strikes me that uh, how effective you are because you don't take creativity personally. You understand that there's just so it's just coming through you, like you've you've been saying, and so it 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 keeps discouragement out of the equation, because oh, yeah. yeah, I just love that. I'd love it if you talk more about that. Sure, sure. I mean, it's not that you, you know you can still get discouraged. I mean, we can think ourselves into all kinds of corners and paint ourselves there and find it hard to get out. But you know, when you understand how our mind works, we can, you know, we know that that can change in a second. So even if you're discouraged that you're only a thought away from a new thought, which means everything can change. So, so that's great, even if you are or happen to get discouraged, and that can come. But um, I realize that I'm a cipher, and I, I see it most clearly in my writing, where I think things want to go in one direction, and then I'll be writing and stuff starts flowing through and then it's like, Oh, wait a minute, this is going this way. And then I kind of have to go, okay, well, let's just see where that goes. And frequently, matter of fact, most of the time, it's better than what I thought we were going to do. You know, we meaning the project, the writing, whatever the story is. And, and then you get into this place where you're co-creating with the project. So you're just sort of guiding it. So like when I write and I think, Oh, at the end of this scene, this needs to happen. And by the time we get to that scene, it's like, oh, this is really amazing. Then you have to then step back and go, does this serve the overall story? And I've abandoned scenes, but there's been other times where that's changed the entire direction of the story and usually for the better. So I'm very clear that David Beeler is smarter than the average bear, but only just. But the creativity that flows through me is genius. So if I can step out of the way and let that flow come through me, man, that's where the gold is. You know, and it's nice to know that um, it's not on me specifically. My job is just to kind of listen for when I go, ooh, ooh, that's cool. Or, um, no, that's not right. You know, and then it feels more of nudging or, or, or just gently directing the creative flow as opposed to, you know, and, and then there's a lot of un unknowing, you know, uh, where you start down a road and you go, I'm going to, anything i'm going to write a poem and i don't know so pick a subject you know i look at it it's a beautiful sunny day so i'm going to write about a beautiful sunny day you know or the twinkle in somebody's eye okay let's do that and then it starts to emerge and it's almost like uh somebody said you know you you can drive uh from boston to los angeles in the dark and your headlights will shine out you know a few hundred feet in front of you and as you go it reveals what's next. As you drive, you see what's next and you just follow the road. And I think creativity is kind of like that. You're in this fog of, I don't know how this is going to turn out or what it wants to be ultimately. So you move forward and then more is revealed as you go forward, like the lights at night. Yeah. Well, th th that's really clear in uh, that story. The, uh, the story that I read, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. And oh, right. Mercy in the West. Mercy in the West, yeah, because I got the, I mean, I was reading through it, and it just, re it reminds me of what Nina and I are re-watching right now, which is Watchmen. 
Well, oh. Watchmen goes in directions that you could never, ever, ever guess. I had the same sense with that story. There was just no, there was no artistic constraint on it. Like you said, it wanted to go somewhere and you let it go there. Yeah. And it was incredibly effective because of that. Yeah, um, and it was, it was fascinating. Uh, Sam Reed, who was the publisher of that, approached me and said, hey, I'd like you, I'm gonna do this anthology. I'd, I'd like to know if you'd like to contribute a short story. He said, because he'd read my scripts, but he'd never read my prose. And he said, I just know you'll do something interesting. And I said, okay, wow. I, was like, I haven't written prose in a very, very long time. I was like, oh, okay. And, and, and then he said, and it's gonna be a crime anthology. And I was like, oh, crud, that's not really a, my, a genre I write in. So I, was like, oh. so I was like, okay. And just started kind of going, okay, well, what could this be about? And then this idea hit me that I had had at one point, but it came back. It was like, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if, if you were a serial killer in the 19th century? Because people died all the time. So yeah. somebody else dying wouldn't be that like, oh my God. You know, and there was no forensic. And I, what if you were a doctor and a serial killer? in the 19th century. And that's where I said to, to Sam, I said, what do you think about this idea? And he goes, oh God, I love that. He said, that's gonna be interesting. I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. So I just started with, um, you know, the idea of what, what, well, I actually started researching and looking for ideas that would sort of ping, you know, to understand what it is to be a serial killer and be in the mind of that. Um, and then trying to figure out how do you, how do you, you know, how does somebody go that, down that path? And so as his backstory became clearer, the idea of what would happen began to emerge too. Yeah. And I don't know, I haven't done it because of time, but I, I have a, a whole idea for it being a TV series, but <laughs> see. <laughs> Look, hope yeah. it is. Because it'd be fun to, to follow his journeys through the West. Yeah. You know, and, and, and uh, yeah. I'd love him to be both uh, a really engaging character that you like, but who's also doing horrible things that make you go, what? But then he has his uh, reasons for doing it. And it's funny, I also got a little psyched out because after I wrote the story, then I uh, watched Dexter because it's about a serial killer. And I thought, well, if I'm going to tell him to develop this into a TV show, I should look at this other TV show where this is what it's all about. And there were so many ideas I had where there was like, damn, they did that. And they did that there. And they did, oh my God. I was like, oh, this is so... And I got discouraged. <laughs> yeah. But then I talked to Sam and he was like, look, he said, how many, how many cop shows are there? I'm like, millions, it seems. And he said, right. And he said, so no matter what you do, it'll wind up being different. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But, uh, you know, a lot of the ideas that I had, I was like, oh, they've already tapped that. Uh, so, you know, but uh, at some point, you know, I, I, I would love to create the time to pursue that some more. Neat. Thanks. Great, thanks, Gary. Jackie, over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm I'm just wondering about where and how much love comes into the picture, because I think I can have a good time writing or a bad time writing. But I think it's love that drives my dedication. Mm. And I wonder if how much, or if you even do, does it matter to you how much, how much you love a particular thing you're doing creatively? Or is it you just love creativity that you love? Hmm. So is does that it, even is that even do you even do you even see it that way? I don't mean to be presumptuous about no, 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 no. um huh, I'm just trying to think here. Um I don't I don't call it love, although I think it is love. You know, uh for me it's it's about engagement and and when i'm excited about something you know and i think that 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 feeling of of being uh captivated 
and excited is, is love. Right. So, you know, last Sunday we did the photography. We started, uh, we met at three 30. We got to the beach around a little after four. Then we drove to the other beach. So it was around four 30 when we got to a location and started to shoot. And I knew that sunset was at seven 44. So, you know, we had this window. So we worked right up or we continued shooting right up until basically uh, everybody else was too cold because the wind coming off the beach was chilly. And uh, so we stopped just as the sun was like literally just set. So right up to like 744. Um, so then we, we drove back to uh, Michael and Nina's house and we had some food. So then I drove home and it was like 1030. And then I stayed up till 3 a.m. working on Photoshop on the shots because I was excited. And my wife woke up and came in all groggy and going, what are you doing? I said, oh, she goes, it's 3 a.m. And I said, is it? She said, yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. I just got excited. And to me, that excitement is, is the love. That's the energy. Because, you know, uh, to me, they're all the same. It's a different word for describing it. Maybe there's a, a you know, a nuance in, in, in love, you know, and, and, and that would then be sort of a thing of like, how are you defining love? And for me, it's just a sort of a, an, an energy of being excited about it and the way that going back to the kids, if you say, you know, Hey, Dashiell, do you want to play hide and seek? Yeah, let's do that. You know, there's just a, an impetus and excitement. It doesn't have to be as demonstrative as it might be in a child, but you have that sense of, Ooh, That'd be neat. That'd be cool. That'd be fun. You know, just the idea of like, you know, I know you do some photography with horses. So if you saw a horse that you just thought was gorgeous, you went, oh, I really want to shoot that horse. And let me rephrase that. I really want to photograph that horse. <laughs> 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 they shoot horses, don't they? Um, so, you know what I mean? But it's that, that, that little, that little inspiration, you know, where your, your body goes, I mean, that's the, or the you know, the, the original etymology of inspire is to breathe in. It's as simple as that. And, and I think that, you know, it, to me, it doesn't have to be love because there are times where um, it's uncomfortable. You know, if a human or any animal gives birth to another animal, that can be uncomfortable. Very much so, according to my wife. Um, you know. But there are, so it's like there are birthing pains and there are times with a project, no matter what it is, where it can be, you know, uncomfortable. And there are times where it's like, uh, going back to that short story, you know, where it was like, ah, I don't know what this wants to, you know, I, uh, I'm unsure and I'm not sure what to, what, what's to happen. Um, you know, that can be uh, difficult. Is this answering your question? But but to me, the, the impetus of like, you know, uh, I'm just excited about the overall project can carry me through. That yeah, helped. no, I, did, I, I, I don't know that I had a really a particular question. It's just that I wanted to explore that area. Oh, okay. Yeah, little, in, in that case, then, and, then, then for me, it's about engagement. Yeah. If I find, hey, buddy. If I find myself being completely engaged, then I, I know that that's me and my creative zone. When things happen like, you know, it's 3 a.m. and I didn't notice the time going at all. You know, when we were doing the shoot, you know, I was just busy. And, and at one point we had to move from one area of the beach to another. We had to walk all the way around to get to the beach part we want to shoot. And I was schlepping a lot of gear, you know but I didn't notice it. And the other day I, I kind of somehow hurt my Achilles tendon. But while I was on the shoot, I didn't notice it at all. My foot didn't hurt the least. Also, I'm, I'm just kind of seeing something about how even with something like love, I don't realize it, but I'm, there are things inside of that and there are things outside of that. And I'm making exclusionary decisions mm. about what I could, what could be 
well, I don't worry a lot about being creative, but it's, there's just something very ex expansive mm. in how, in how cool. you're talking about it that isn't like, where are the parameters? Where are the borders? This is a wonderful thing I have found. Yay, this is it. Everything else is outside of it and not as important, and not as meaningful. Um, hmm. Well, I was just saying, because to me, it's all love. I mean, you know, that's, yeah. that's the... You know, so, uh, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm chasing whatever that project or idea might be, you know, the idea that, that is, is appealing and that's, so yeah, uh, it's all love, but yeah, you are making decisions and there, there is a this and a that because you're going from the formless, which I think is the all love into the form where you're actually making decisions and creating something specific. So that process of going from it's all possible to this is what it is, is uh, a process of decision, but the energy that's all that potential and all that possibility is love. If one wants to define it that broadly or energy that you're then bringing into form through this specific expression, but the expression of that form is love. <laughs> So, you know what I mean? I, uh, yes. I'm sounding very Buddhist at the moment. <laughs> uh, I need to go sit on a mountain. <laughs> I think Thanks. there is some connection between creativity and, and spirituality. Oh, totally. It's, it's just, it totally. seems there are so many things that happen in the creative process where we're caught up, we're inspired, where something is coming through us from a non-sensual uh, non-analytical space and moving through us and if that's to me if that isn't what spirituality is I don't know what it is yeah yeah and, and I think you know uh, people who who do identify with being creative uh, you know or, or just exercise that muscle a little more because it's something that they do more often I, I, I think they experience that, that sense of you know the create uh, the divine coming through you know that that channeling something that's beyond you yeah because that's my experience of it you know uh, as i was yeah. talking to gary you know it's it's especially i see it most clearly with the writing where it, it comes through me and the best times or my best writing is when it is coming through me and you know the artists have always called it, there's the muse that descends you know inspiration strikes you know uh and, and I think it's good to know that it's there all the time. We are it. We're made of it. We are creativity, you know, manifest in this form. You know, we are love manifest in form. Um, and then what you're doing is just calling forth that energy, that love into a specific form that you're chasing, which whether it be a poem or a painting or a song or, uh, a, a, you know, a beautiful meal or you know, um, or problem solving, you know, even if you're, anytime you're doing any of those things, you're, you're being creative. Yeah. I think that idea of exploration, it, there, and there's a, there's a whole big mix here of exploration, discovery, love, that it's hard to know whether you're doing it or it's doing you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that willingness to be open to it, yeah. that willing and that excitement that comes through the what if, the wonder and the questions. Yeah. And, and if you embrace the journey of that, the adventure of it, then you don't know. And it's fun to find out, yeah. you know, because then you're on a, you know, little micro journey of, of like, oh, I don't know. Let's see what this wants to be. Let's see what happens. Yeah. You know, uh, entertaining ambiguity. Is, is a phrase that uh, Michael used many years ago, back when we both still lived in London, and I always liked that term. You know, your ability to entertain ambiguity. I always thought of like, I always had a picture of my head of a, a, a dinner for two with candles and you know, I'm serving a nice meal to ambiguity, so I'm entertaining ambiguity. <laughs> but uh, that's just my brain. <laughs> it goes places. <laughs> Oh, well, this has been lovely. Last call for questions. Otherwise, we're going to thank David for being his wonderful multi-potentialite self. 
and to please keep doing more of it. Oh, well, I, I can't not. <laughs> so Good. It's, uh, there's a line from Hamlet, like a Hamlet, like a hectic, it rages in my blood. So a uh, couple things. Can I, can I do a please. little, uh, little pimping? Yes, I was, I was going to ask you not specifically to pimp, but to let people know where they can find you and what you're up to. Okay, well, um, this is a, a, as you can see that, it's a feature film called Trouble Is My Business that I helped produce, I also act in. Very proud of how this turned out. Tom Conkle, the director, and Michael Smith, his uh, partner in, in the uh, production company uh, that I was also a part of, um, really created a, a, an amazing 1940s crime thriller. And uh, on a shoestring budget, and, and the look and the feel of the film, plus the, the intriguing story, I, I'm really proud of, of how that turned out. Where can we find it's it? It's available on Amazon, Trouble okay. Is My Business. And I didn't do it. I will send you some links so that uh, if, if people want to come back to this uh, on Nina's site, there'll be links available. There's also what Gary and I were talking about, the miscreants, murderers, and thieves. Uh, this has my short story in it. And this is also available on Amazon. Isn't everything on Amazon? Um, and uh, BeelerPhotography.com. You can go look at some of my photography. Beeler Creative is sort of in, in flux at the moment. It used to be I was doing uh, web stuff and, and sort of like being a small marketing agency. But then I was thought, ah, that's not really what I want to be doing. So I kind of pulled the plug on it. But I want to revamp it for all of this, all the creative stuff I do. So um, those are some things that you can uh, check out if you're so inclined. Um, thank you. So thank you. Uh, thanks everybody. This has been really fun. Uh, and what a, what a, what a fun, cool conversation and, and one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, Cause I like to live this stuff, yeah. but we're all creative. Just take that away. No matter what you do, you can't not be creative. Even in thinking you're not creative, you're being creative, <laughs> right? <laughs> so just get your brain around the idea that you are uh, the creative potential of the universe manifest and unfolding. And then if you decide to take something from formless into form, cool, go for it. Enjoy the journey. Be surprised with the turns that you can't predict, you know, uh, of which this year's had a lot. <laughs> Perfect words to end. So thanks so much, David. And thank you everybody for being on the call. Take good care. We'll see you next week. Ciao. Ciao, Bella. Ciao, ciao. ciao. <laughs>